So um, thank you all for, uh, for coming and for attending uh, this uh, Applied PD seminar, uh, which is uh, delivered online, uh, as it always is, but uh, you know, definitely nowadays. Um, the speaker today is Professor Nancy Rodriguez from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Um, Professor Rodriguez um, did her PhD at UCLA uh, under the direction of uh, Professor Bertozzi. And I think that was mainly related to the crime statistics and, and things like that. Uh, and after a um, NSF postdoctoral fellowship at Stanford University, she became an assistant professor at uh, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill before moving to uh, Colorado Boulder in uh, 2017, where she's been since then. And today she'll tell us about, um, uh, she'll tell us a story on the ideal free distribution and the LE effect. And, uh, and different things related to affection diffusion equations. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Bernard, and thank you everybody uh, for the uh, opportunity to talk to you today about some recent work. Um, and, oh, and of course now, okay. Um, and what I wanna talk about is movement of organisms. Um, so in ecology, uh, movement, uh, it's known to be key to the survival, uh, but also, you know, the approach that a company takes to place their stores can make or break their company. So in this case, you wouldn't necessarily think of it as movement, but rather uh, potentially relocation strategy. So in this talk, I really want to focus on the critical role of movement uh, or placement strategies in the context um, of, of the ALI effect and the ideal free distribution. And I'll spend uh, a few slides uh, really defining uh, what these two concepts are, uh, but originally really um, sort of came up in, in ecology. And then I want to talk about sort of how do we measure the robustness of, of different uh, strategies. So I want to present a unified framework through the lens of reaction advection diffusion equations that will enable us to connect and, and study these concepts. So let's start off with the Ali effect. Um, this effect is, is the decline of individual fitness at low population size or density. And this could you know, have uh, many reasons. One of them uh, that has been observed is, you know, species such as uh, the prairie dogs that I have uh, pictured here or this passenger pigeons, they have a very uh, a highly social structure. And so at high densities, they're able to communicate with each other uh, about predators, but this communication network breaks down uh, at low densities and therefore the population ends up declining. Um, so in essence, uh, we'll be thinking about either populations that suffer from an ALI effect um, or uh, in economics, uh, uh, places, you know, stores like retail stores are also subject to an ALI effect. And so this, this, this work really started when I was talking to my collaborators, Chris Costner and Henri Beristicki, we like to talk about sort of the connections between ecology and economics. And uh, we realized that the way you place coffee shops versus shoe stores is very different, right? Uh, people will not go to a shoe store because it's close to them, but rather they're going to go to a place where there's gonna be a high density of them because they know they're not likely going to be uh, buying shoes in, in, um, in the first store that they walk into. So you also see this Ali effect, uh, although this terminology is not used uh, for many retail stores. And uh, you also see them in industrial clusters. I'm working with an economist in China who's interested, was interested in understanding why many factories um, sort of uh, cluster together even though they were, comp they were uh, competing with, with each other. So that's, that's on the, uh, the Ali effect. Let me now talk about the ideal free distribution. Um, this is uh, the, the, the concept of how individuals would move if they were free to move in order to optimize their resources. So if you have ideal knowledge of the environment and then you're free to move as, your desi uh, as you desire, then really the population should match the resources, right? And at an ideal free distribution, all individuals are going to have 
equal fitness or they would move. So if I just take a simple uh, environment where I have two patches and one has twice as many resources, you would expect the, popula uh, the population at the patch that has you know, twice as many resources to be twice um, as big as the one uh, that has less resources. Um, and so the ideal free distribution can be viewed in the context of game theory where sort of individuals are moving in response to other individuals. And this strategy is the movement strategy. So there's, there's evidence of the ideal free distributions, both experimentally and um, observational. So experimentally, social spiders um, have been seen that in areas where there's smaller insects, they have smaller communities. Uh, same but with bumblebees, they tend to distribute proportionally based on the plant density. And then observationally in social systems, um, children selling water in Istanbul have been, um, it's been measured that their density uh, matches the number of cars that are passing by uh, in, in, in this study. Um, and Basterolites um, in Cameroon also were seen to distribute themselves uh, proportionally to the quality and quantity of, of the resources. So this is something that we, we do see in, in real life. And so to obtain the ideal free distribution, I mentioned, right, you, your strategy is going to be a movement strategy. And so how do we measure whether a movement strategy is good? Well, one way is to determine whether it um, gives you an ideal free distribution, but uh, there are actually many, many ways to try to determine whether a uh, movement strategy is beneficial, but two key ways to, to sort of determine if they're good is to see if they're evolutionarily stable strategies. That uh, is one, and this is a strategy that basically, if it's adopted by a population, um, it leads um, the population uh, being able to resist any invasion by an al alternative strategy, provided that uh, initial population is small. So that's what I mean by, by rare. Um, a neighborhood invader strategy is sort of similar, but um, in this case, it's one that can invade other populations uh, using other strategies to be able to replace them. Uh, we have, um, we'll focus, um, our numerical results will focus on evolution, evolutionary stability, but for theoretical results, we'll, we'll talk about neighboring, neighborhood uh, invader strategies. So again, these strategies are very important in game theory, ecology, um, and it is true that many times the strategies that lead to an ideal free distribution lead to the to an evolutionarily stable strategy um, and to neighborhood invader strategies. So they tend to be good, good strategies. So as we're talking about movement, um, I want to, or movement strategies, I want to differentiate, uh, you know, between unconditional dispersal and conditional dispersal. So condition, unconditional dispersal is movement or dispersal that's independent of the environment or, or the population. And conditional dispersal is dependent on the environment and, and on the population. Um, and really it was McPeak and Holt who, who uh, made or coined these two distinct, uh, distinct terms. So we're going to study, uh, again, these strategies through the lens of reaction advection diffusion equations. Um, Again, they have you been heavily used in spatial ecology really since Skellum's um, 1951 paper relating random walks of species to the heat equation. Um, and so the development of, of reaction advection diffusion theory really has gone hand in hand with further understanding of ecological systems. Um, and then more recently, maybe not so recent anymore, uh, but these systems have been used to, to study social complex systems. Uh, ranging from urban crime, uh, riot dynamics, things that I've worked on myself, uh, to opinion dynamics. Um, and I'm just going to mention that in this context, uh, if I'm using the framework of reaction advection diffusion equations, this is not going to be the appropriate framework for placing stores, retail stores, but it could be appropriate for things like street vendors. Um, and 
uh, I would say that it's not necessarily a limited app uh, um, application because uh, in many in many countries such as Mexico, India, uh, street vendors actually um, are a huge, well, significant portion of, of the population, right? 2% of the population in, in India is quite large and they do provide an important service to, to many communities. Um, but something like shoe shops, uh, this would not be an appropriate framework. So let me talk in this framework, let me just give you a little bit on previous work. Um, using the framework of reaction advection diffusion equations um, to study these concepts really, I think, started uh, with Hastings uh, in 1983, where he was trying to understand whether if you have spatially varying uh, environments, although temporally constant, then, um, then um, smaller uh, conditional dispersals uh, would be selected for, um, or, or larger, sorry, faster, trying to determine if that was the case. Um, so he, uh, and I'll, I'll focus a little bit more on, on his idea, which is very, very, very simple. Um, so it turns out that smaller condition, uh, so smaller unconditional dispersal is, is always selected for. Uh, this was generalized um, in 1998 by Dougherty. And, but it turns out that if you have unconditional dispersal with spatially and temporally varying environments, then the diffusion may, be, may actually be better, uh, faster diffusion may be better. Um, and then people have studied, well, what if you have conditional dispersal? Uh, then in some cases, conditional dispersal has been shown to actually increase persistence of, of species. Um, so usually the conditional dispersal that's studied is passive diffusion uh, plus movement of gradients of a resource, which is what I'm going to focus on. So let me just, you know, mention the idea of Hastings uh, because then it's going to be a matter of generalizing this to other types of movements uh, and, and may and um, uh, yeah, other types of conditional dispersal. Um, so if you have a population that uh, is established, so you have an equilibrium of one, uh, and the conditions are that, well, this is uh, going to be an elliptic operator, um, and uh, my growth pattern is such that I have one stable non-constant equilibrium, then how can I determine whether a population that's rare will be able to invade? Well, assuming that it, competes for the same resources and it behaves exactly the same way except with a different diffusion D, um, then I'm just going to look at the stability and the growth pattern of course takes into account the competition uh, with the established species. And so it's just a matter of, of studying the local stability of n is equal to zero. And so it turns out that if, um, if D is larger, if, if little d, right, if the invading population um, diffuses with a faster, a larger coefficient, then, then um, n is equal to zero is little n is equal to zero, is locally asymptotically stable, and so you expect the population to die off. So no diffusion, really, um, when I'm talking about this type of diffusion, is an evolutionarily stable strategy, right? You can always diffuse a little bit slower and do, and do better. So our framework, we're basically going to generalize this. We're going to uh, let you represent a population density, right? It could be um, population of animals or street vendors. Uh, for the most part, I'll talk about a bounded domain. And here's, here's my framework. Again, it's, it's local. Right, so it's limited in, in the type of movements that I'm going to be considering. Uh, F is my growth pattern, and I think of M as again my rearrangement mechanism or my movement strategy. And what I want to answer specifically or look into is are the rearrangement mechanisms that can help overcome the Ali effect? So I'll talk a little bit about you know that's going to be modeled in F. Can species have an ideal free distribution when an Ali effect is present? Uh, and if so, is it evolutionarily stable? Uh, I guess mostly I will fo focus on whether it's a neighborhood invader strategy. And then what happens under competition? 
So uh, just a little bit of background. What do I mean uh, are the rearrangement mechanisms or movement strategies that can help overcome the LE effect? This is uh, just to make it clear, let me talk about the classical reaction diffusion equation, equation right? So here I just have passive diffusion um, and typical growth patterns, right, are logistic and, and bistable. The bistable um, models um, a, a strong LE effect uh, in this case, which is what we're gonna, going to consider. Um, and of course, the logistic uh, gives us the, the you know, famous Fisher KPP equation. So uh, what is relevant, right? These two the systems or these equations have been studied a lot. Um, what is relevant for what I will be talking about is, uh, well, one, the existence of non-trivial equilibrium solutions for the, for the Dirichlet and um, the Neumann problems. Um, so for the KPP case, we know that depending on mu or the, or the domain for the Dirichlet problem, the existence of the non-trivial equilibrium solution depends on the stability of u is equal to zero, right? Which depends on the domain or on, on mu here. Uh, for the Neumann problem, uh, u is equal to m is always stable. Um, and of course, then the dynamics depend, it, they're n once you know the stability of u is equal to zero, um, they're pretty straightforward. The bistable equation, on the other hand, uh, is more complex. Um, in particular, um, I'm interested in sort of the dynamics. And um, if you have initial data, let's say uh, initial data that's less than, than theta, uh, this is called the elite threshold, then you will, um, the population will uh, go extinct right, uniformly in X. But if your initial population is larger than theta, if it's uh, everywhere above theta, then U of XT, the solution will actually survive and approach the, the resources. Um, if you have initial data that, uh, you know, in some locations it's below X and some locations above X, then it's a lot more complicated to determine what actually happens. So the dynamics of, of the bistable equation is certainly much harder than the Fisher KPP equation. So we are going to generalize. So basically, again, if, if you don't have enough resources, if your population is not sufficiently large, then it's not going to survive. And this gives me one condition. It's not the most general condition because, again, there are cases where you may be above theta and still not survive. But uh, let me just focus on this simple case. And so we, we want to try to understand, to begin with, uh, is what if we add uh, some conditional dispersal. So in this case, I'm taking my passive diffusion, I'm adding some bias movement towards some signal that I call A, um, and think of chi as my speed. And I want to try to understand whether I can start off with resources below theta and still survive, okay? Um, so I'm assuming, again, a bistable growth pattern. So here's a typical example. Uh, so M is my resources, right? This is the carrying capacity, and theta is the elite threshold. I will also assume that for, a, for um, every location, if I look at the function F as uh, so a function of U, uh, its mass is between zero and, and M of X naught is going to be positive. And I'll denote the antiderivative by, by capital F. So just some technicalities. Uh, we work with signals that are non-constant, obviously, otherwise this, we just go back to passive diffusion. Um, they're gonna be smooth en enough. And for the most part, this condition A3 is not going to be necessary, uh, so, but I'll point, it out, I'll point out where it is actually necessary. And then again, my admissible growth patterns are just going to be bistable. They can, for the most part, for most of the results can depend, on, they could be spatially heterogeneous, smooth enough. Uh, and I always want M to be, the resources to be bigger than my, than my uh, Ali threshold. It would be interesting to consider um, cases where that's not the case, but then the, global solutions are not necessarily going to be classical and that the, 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 the theory of the 
global existence is, is quite subtle in that case. So just keep in mind this, um, you know, the, the, the typical bistable equation. Again, M represents the resources of beta, the, the elite threshold. And note that the signal and the resources are independent for now, okay? Um, so if we do a change of variables, uh, we, we, we get the system now for V. Uh, now this satisfies the Neumann, uh, homogeneous Neumann boundary conditions, and it has a maximum and comparison principle. Uh, so then that means whether we can, we can use a uh, method of super and sub solutions. Uh, for those of you guys who are not familiar, uh, I'm just giving the definition. I'm not really giving the, the regularity on W, but basically we're looking for uh, functions that actually sa satisfy inequalities. And then if you have a sub solution, you, you change that. So this is really nice because using uh, the comparison principle, we actually get that a uniform bound on um, all equilibrium solutions. Um, and it, we also get global classical solutions. So, you know, classical theory gives us a local and time solution. And then because we have these maximum principles, we can obtain um, a global bound, which allows us to extend our solutions uh, again, they're going to be classical and they're going to be global in time under the conditions that I've stated, right? So the evolution problem uh, is well defined. Okay. Um, in, in, for the V equation, um, we see that actually it has um, a variational formulation. And so I have this energy here um, through some, for classical solutions, some easy computations, we, we actually see that uh, this energy decreases in time for a solution for classical solutions, uh, and so we can use this actually to to discuss the first couple of results that um, that I'm going to talk about today, and uh, that is the existence of positive equilibrium solutions. First, for the Dirichlet problem, uh, if mu is sufficiently small, so this is similar to what we had for the passive diffusion case, right? For the classical reaction diffusion equation, um, except we're going to be working with um, an H1 space with a weighted inner product. Um, just briefly, uh, you prove that the Palais male condition holds, um, and then you use the mountain pass theorem to get the second equilibrium solution. I don't want to spend too much talking about the details. I just want to mention that, of course, uh, U is equal to zero is a minimizer, right? And we're looking for non-trivial equilibrium solutions. And so it be in the proof, it's important to find or determine that, in fact, there is some function uh, in my space where the energy is less than zero. And we just have a crude estimate where um, you, this is a good term uh, and this is a bad term. And notice that they, you know, both depend on chi and on my signal. So we should be able to... Um, Chi and A should actually play a role to get a crit, you know, to get a sharp result. And in this case, we really can't. Uh, so we are not taking advantage of Chi and A. Uh, and I think more subtle estimates, uh, you know, would be needed to be able to get a sharp result in this case, where you are taking advantage of potentially saying Chi is large or A is concentrated. Um, to get a wider range of existence for for these positive equilibrium solutions. Nancy, can I make a quick remark? Yes. Uh, it appears that when you use your uh, mouse to highlight, uh, what you're actually highlighting is actually covered up for us by a preview of oh, your. Oh, okay. Page. So I will I will not do that. Yeah, yeah. You can you uh, move your mouse to point, but maybe not yeah. try to highlight. That sounds good. Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. Okay, uh, we have um, also the existence of uh, stationary positive solutions for the no-flux problem. Uh, here, this results a little bit limited or more limited. You have one positive equilibrium um, solution and at least two if mu is small. Uh, and this is because for the mountain pass theorem, we need, uh, we need this condition here um, on, on, on mu, right, which was the diffusivity. Okay, 
So now uh, we sort of understand we don't have sharp results, but we, we do know under some conditions where we have uh, equilibrium solutions. But we really are interested in the time evolution problem. Um, so unfortunately, we don't have a general result for chi. We, we have some partial results, and I'll talk about it uh, in the bounded domain case. Uh, they're more general in our end, so I will talk about that in a second. But let me just mention that if chi is sufficiently small, so basically think of this as a speed, right? So um, your desire to move up gradients of, of the signal is small. Uh, here I need um, the uh, Laplacian of A to change signs. And let me, for simplicity, assume that uh, m is equal to 1 and theta are constant. And basically what we get here is that if, if chi is sufficiently small, then the behavior is going to be the same as for the classical reaction diffusion equation. Right, so we are now going to be if 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 your if your movement if your bias movement is uh, only has a small influence, then uh, the population will not be able to overcome the LE effect. So somehow you're going to need chi sufficiently sufficiently large. Of course, um, the chi depends on the signal, right? So two ways that you can you can see this is you can either change chi or you can change the signal. Uh, so I'm fixing the signal for a given signal. Um, then you, you can see that if you start off with uh, constant initial conditions, let's say below theta, and if chi is sufficiently small, then you're going to have a super solution and therefore your, your, your population has to decay to zero. Um, so again, it depends on, on the signal A. And the reason why I needed that condition A3 where you want the, the, the normal derivative of A to be zero was simply because then we could use constants as super and sub solutions. But for the rest of the results, we don't really need this. For chi general, what we do see, we do see some differences once we have a signal, a bias signal. Um, just for simplicity, let me mention uh, the domain zero one. It could be generalized, but let let omega uh, eta be um, basically a subset of my domain where e to the chi a is bigger than its average. Okay, and so under the conditions for a, basically we know that this is going to have positive measure if eta is sufficiently small, um, and um, if it, it, and let me consider uh, the the classical bistable you know reaction term that I mentioned you know sort of to keep in mind where theta is less than one half. What we do have is that if epsilon is sufficiently small and mu is sufficiently large, then there is some time t where the population is above theta, even though it started below theta. Um, uh, so if here's my, oh, let me not do that. Here's my initial uh, condition. So it is below theta. There's going to be some time t where it's going to be above theta in this region. That's going to be in the region where, in the domain where uh, e to the chi a is above its average, right? So that's where it's going to concentrate. So there's always going to be some initial growth but unfortunately, this does not imply that you will persist in the long term. Uh, and in fact, um, the proof doesn't, again, it doesn't use chi or A, so you don't expect it um, to be the case that it has to remain above theta um, for, for all T unless chi uh, is large enough or A is sort of concentrated. So, this is sort of a, a numerical verification. So here's my equation. I'll take this Gaussian signal uh, and here's F. So the elite threshold is 0.2. And let me start off with initial data 0.2. So you're, above, you're below the elite threshold. And what you see here is if, if chi is 1, then initially it, it actually does go above the elite threshold in the areas where you would expect. But eventually it actually goes to zero. I mean, it it's it's not it's difficult to see unless you actually look at the numbers. This is basically zero. But if chi is large enough, uh, then it actually will go to an equilibrium, 
uh, and so the population will survive. And again, it's going to, going to be above the elite threshold in the areas where we would expect, right? Where e to the chi a is bigger than its average. In general, um, what we conjecture and what we can prove if we don't have boundaries to deal with is that given any initial, uh, initial data that's below the elite threshold, you can always find a chi for a fixed environment, again, or signal that satisfies our condition, you can always find a speed sufficiently large that helps you overcome the Ali effect. And of course, the smaller the initial condition, the larger that you need that speed to be. Again, you can fix chi and also change A, but we're choosing to, to just uh, change chi. Um, coming up with you, if, if you, you can try to prove this with just finding suitable super and sub solutions, but that has been incredibly hard because of the boundaries, uh, dealing with the boundaries. So then, you know, uh, we said, well, let's not worry about boundaries and look at the Cauchy problem. Uh, so let me briefly talk about this uh, before I talk about the ideal free distribution. Um, and so here now, let's talk about the Cauchy problem. I don't have boundary conditions. Um, there's, I'm, there is a, a subtle, theory for the global existence of solutions that don't grow too fast at infinity, uh, but we are allowing growth for these solutions, which I'm not going to touch on, but it, it, it is subtle. Uh, but there is a global existence theory for that, and also uh, maximum and comparison, comp comparison principles for this, which I am not going to talk about. Um, but in this case, uh, if you have, again, a signal um, that now satisfies condition three, we do have that uh, if chi is not, not, if it's not large enough, then the population will actually decay to zero uh, and it's gonna behave like the classical reaction diffusion equation. But if chi is large enough, then the population will converge to a positive equilibrium solution to the Cauchy problem. Um, so, that this is not a sharp result, but under some conditions, uh, which might seem restrictive, but I want to point out that it actually corresponds to uh, a famous process, the ornstein ullenbeck stochastic process, which has this Fokker-Planck equation. Uh, we get this from our equation if we choose a very specific signal here, A, uh, and in this case, we actually do obtain a sharp result, right? So there's going to be a critical speed uh, that is required for your population to actually be able to overcome the LE effect, okay? Um, okay, so that's, the, that's all I'm gonna say for, for the Cauchy problem. Um, let me now talk about sort of um, the connection to the ideal free distribution. Uh, and so one of the questions, the second question that I posed was, can a species have an ideal free distribution when an LE effect is present um, and how? So before I had my, my signal was A and my resources in M and they were not connected, right? So this is my, my movement strategy. Uh, an ideal free distribution, I just want to remind you, means that U is equal to F is an equilibrium solution. So it would make sense that maybe my signal would depend on, on, on the resources. And so if I just use M as my signal, this does not lead to an ideal free distribution. But if I use um, A is the natural log of M, where chi is exactly equal to one, then in fact, you do have that M is, uh, that you do, you do have an ideal free distribution. That is U is equal to M is an equilibrium solution. So this actually only uses local information, even though under the assumptions for the ideal free distribution, you know, species had global information, right? So global information is not really necessary. Uh, so the question is, is it a, is it a good strategy? So if I'm talking about two competitors, right, you know, two populations using the same resources, 
you know, two businesses trying to get the same customers. Um, and they're similar except in their dispersal strategies, then we're going to be studying uh, this system here, where again, now my, my, I, my growth pattern has to take into account the competition. So one thing that makes this, um, I, I mean, the, the function C that we're looking at interesting is that this system is competitive at low densities, but it's, uh, no, it's cooperative at low densities, but competitive at, at high densities. Um, so the presence of competitors is actually beneficial at low densities, but of course then it's not beneficial once, uh, once you have high densities. Um, so I want to study the system, and in particular, I want to focus on, um, on the case where I have one population using a strategy that leads to an ideal free distribution, this is you and one that maybe uses a similar strategy. We can actually generalize this, uh, but for now, just to be concrete, let, let me now just say that this is gonna move V, the population V will move, except maybe at a different speed, but also moving up gradients of, of the resources. Um, and so we wanna try to understand whether, you know, um, one strategy is better than the other. So numerically, what we see is that even if, if U has a much smaller uh, density than V, it's eventually going to do much better. Uh, so here, blue is U and V is, is red. So it survives, but it's, you know, um, certainly a lot smaller than U, even though initially the resources or the initial population was larger. So we do have evidence. Uh, that uh, the ideal free distribution is evolutionarily stable, but it's not, at least locally, but it's not that uh, easy to prove. Um, what we can prove is that it is a neighborhood invader strategy. Uh, so let's assume that uh, V is such that it has an equilibrium solution, a positive equilibrium solution that's bigger than theta. We know that this is the case when chi is sufficiently small or when chi is close to one. And we have, again, other movement conditions where, where that is satisfied. Um, and in that case, we know that uh, the strategy leading to an ideal free distribution is a neighborhood invader. And basically, this really boils down to understanding the stability of zero V star. So what we're trying to show is V star is established, okay? Um, it's established and the equilibrium is bigger than theta everywhere by assumption, right? We made sure to focus on movement strategies that only gave us um, equilibrium, so led to equilibrium solutions that were above theta. Um, and in that case, um, we can show that if, again, V star is bigger than theta, then zero V star is going to be unstable. So even if U is very small, you would expect uh, the system to converge to uh, uh, an equilibrium solution where U is not equal to zero, okay? The fact that it's um, evolu locally evolutionary, it evolutionarily stable, we have some results, but not, we, 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 we don't have a proof that that's the case, although we believe that it is the case. Okay, so the dynamics here, though, are not quite as straightforward as in the logistic case. When you have logistic growth, it is clear that a population should follow the strategy that leads to an ideal free distribution. In this case, it's not quite as straightforward because you might, um, it's, you might be following the ideal, the, the movement strategy, but if you don't have the appropriate amount of resources, you're not going to converge to an ideal free distribution. So here's an example where I'm varying the LE threshold. Um, and so this is spatially varying. This is uh, my, my signal, which is the same as uh, I'm taking to be the natural log of, of the resources. And if here's my initial, um, the initial distribution, and the population survives, but it does not converge to the ideal free distribution. That is, it does not match the resources unless the resources are sufficiently large. 
um, it is also not clear that it's the best strategy, right? Uh, other possible movement strategies are moving down gradients of the threshold. Um, and sometimes, well, that does not lead you to an ideal free distribution, it, you at least survive. So here's an, uh, a population that has um, this characteristic function as the initial condition. Uh, and it's moving down gradients of the elite threshold and it actually survives. Here's a population that has the same initial distribution and it's following the, I, the strategy that leads or should lead to an ideal free distribution and the population does not survive, right? So it's not clear uh, and we're trying to determine sort of the conditions on the resources versus the threshold. Some cases are pretty clear. Um, for example, if if you're, you know, if they're negatively correlated, then uh, it's it's clear. But if if they're not, then it's not clear what the strategy should be. Um, okay, so moving beyond local movement. So clearly, if you want to study sort of um, um, study more general retail stores non-local operators um, are, are going to be important. So one can, and one can study, uh, so Bernard mentioned that one of my works as a graduate student was working on crime, the other was working on this type of equations here, where you, look, where you have a more general um, diffusion term. And in this case, uh, you have a competition between diffusion and aggregation. So K, this kernel aggregates, uh, and it would be interesting to try to study this, but unfortunately here you don't have maximum principles, but there are some things that you can do. And then of course, considering integral differential equations or position jump or position birth jump processes would, would, be, would be of interest. Um, so let me just sort of end with some key takeaways. Um, obviously competition can be good to overcome the ALI effect. Um, and, move, and moving fast can actually be beneficial when you don't have competition. But if you move too fast uh, and there's competition, then this could be counterproductive. Um, in competitive cases, again, the relocation strategy matters more than the initial distribution uh, or the amount of resources invested. Um, and I think in terms of trying to determine sort of what the optimal strategy is, is I think one that's sort of callous and it's, probably that cooperating with competitors while well, you beat the LE effect, uh, the LE threshold is good. And then of course you move to the ideal free distribution to try to beat out your competitors. Um, but there's still a lot of uh, directions to be, uh, that we can move this direction in and many questions that we still have not answered. Um, so with that, let me thank you and my collaborators on Rebear Sticky and Chris Costner. All right, thank you.